Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Have you ever wondered how butter and ice cream are made? Well, today you're going to find out because we're visiting Homestead Creamery in Works, Virginia. So today we're at Homestead Creamery and we're learning how to make butter and ice cream. But those two things can only be made starting with milk. So Brandon, walk me through a day in the life of on your dairy farm. So basically, on a dairy farm, your sole responsibility is to take care of your animals. So we milk our cows twice a day. So at I get up around 3 o'clock in the morning, and I start milking around 3.30. And then uh, once you get done milking, your responsibility is to feed, take care of the babies, make sure all the cows are healthy. Um, our feeding process is, is a little bit different here than it is at the Jersey farm. At the Jerseys, we do a lot of of uh, different grazing. So we go out and we change and put them in new parts of the pasture every day. Uh, so when you get done with that, it could be between seven and eight o'clock. Um, and then during the day, it's either a crop season or it's, uh, if you have a sick cow, you might have to have the, the vet or the animal doctor come out. Uh, you might meet the, uh, the cow nutritionist or cow dietitian. Right. And make sure that you've got uh, the right material that's that's feeding the cows. Um, so basically, your number one priority on a farm is cow care. And here we grow uh, most all of our own feed that we feed the cows. So when we're not feeding or taking care of the animals, we're we're moving crops and, and storing crops and harvesting crops in order to take care of them. So as you go through that process, the other thing you have to do is maintain fence. Uh, you know, keep weeds down. You have to uh, do things to make sure that your that your farm can continue on. How many generations are on this farm now? So me and my brother are fourth generation. So we, my great grandfather started the farm, and then we farmed actually with my grandpa, and then with my grandpa and dad, and now it's me and him, and, and dad's pretty well at the creamery all the time. Has been for years. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a son that would be the fifth generation. Um, and it's kind of interesting to me to understand how the how things have changed in the world that has affected dairy farming and the lifestyle. It used to be in my grandpa's age, you know, there was no stress, there was no technology. And now, you know, you want to make sure, me and my brother are somewhat perfectionists and we want to have the healthiest cows, we want the happiest cows, and <laughs> we want to make the right feed and uh, so we can produce the healthiest product. and. We, there's more stress nowadays due to a lot of things, including technology, that weren't on the family farm. So Jamie, here we are in the milk parlor. I'd like for you to walk me through the steps of milking the cow. When she comes into the stanchion, what happens? Okay, so we've got a double six parlor here, so there's six, that means there are six milkers on each side. So we'll get six cows on each side of the barn. The first thing we do is we get a paper towel and we'll wipe off any excess dirt or sawdust that they might have on their udder. And then we have a dip that we use and it's, it's hanging back here. Let me, let me show it to you. Let me see, you may not want to do it. Um, so this is actually a peroxide-based dip. And so we'll dip each one of their teats with this 
and it just disinfects it, kills all the bacteria before mm -hmm. we put the milker on. So that sets on there for about 30 seconds. Then we get another paper towel and we go through and we wipe the dip off and get them good and clean and dry. So then we're ready to put the milkers on. Um, these are the milking machines right here, so we'll attach those to the udder. And then it'll take about five minutes per cow for her to give all of her milk. Okay. And then when she gets done, there's a sensor in the machine that knows that there's no more milk flowing through there, so it'll automatically pull the milker off whenever she finishes. So then when they're all done, we have a different dip that we use right here. And so we dip each one of the teats with this and it forms a barrier on the end of their teeth that help keeps the dirt and the bacteria from getting up in there before the next milking. So then when they're all done, we open the front gate and they go out and hopefully to the bunk to start eating. So, start eating and yep. make more milk, right? Yep, that's right. So I know individual animals vary, but how much milk does an average cow give? Okay, so we have Holsteins here on this farm. And right now, our Holsteins are averaging between nine and 10 gallons per cow per day. Okay. So we measure milk in pounds, that's around 80 pounds per cow per day. All of that goes to the creamery. That's right. Correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that you milk Holsteins here, that's but you right. also have another farm where you have Jerseys. We do. Mm -hmm. So why, why mix the, the two breeds? What's, what's the difference? Well, we started milking jerseys about a year ago at the other location. Um, jerseys have some advantages over Holsteins. They don't give as much milk as far as volume of milk, but their milk is a whole lot higher butterfat content. So that, that helps us at the creamery because it, it gives us extra cream to make butter and ice cream with. So um, that's one advantage. A jersey is a smaller animal, so they don't eat as much feed. It doesn't cost as much to feed them. So even though they don't give as much milk, they tend to be more efficient at, at converting what feeds you feed them into a saleable product. So that's probably the, the main reason that we decided to, to try milking some jerseys at the other location. So. Okay. When you milk the cow and the milkers go onto her udder, does it hurt her? No, actually the cows, it's funny, cows are, are creatures of habit. And so if it gets, for some reason, we're late milking one day and they know it's milking time and they'll start moving towards the parlor because if you think about it, she's given 80 pounds a day. So we're milking twice a day. So that means each time we milk, she's given about 40 pounds. So she's got, she's carrying all that extra weight around. It's putting pressure on her udder. So she's ready to be relieved of that pressure. So no, it, it's not, um, it doesn't hurt, it, it doesn't hurt it really the cow. It doesn't hurt it, it anything actually, else. That's right. Yes. It actually relieves the pressure. And, um, so they're glad to come into the parlor usually. So. So to keep a cow in milk production year round, are the cows kept bred? Do you, do you, are they bred several times a year? They have, they average a, having a calf about every 13 months. So um, they have to be bred. You have to keep a cow bred for her to keep producing milk. So she'll mm -hmm. actually, after she has her calves, she will peak in production. She'll pick up in milk production and she'll peak at about 60 days. And then she'll hold her peak in production for several months. And then as she gets closer and closer to having another calf, she'll start to tail off in production. So then actually two months before she's due to have her calf, we will turn her dry. We won't milk her at all for two months. It's just kind of a rest period for her to rest mm -hmm. up before she has her calf. Um, and then once she has her calf, it starts all over again. So. Um, Sometimes you have to breed them more than once to get them pregnant, but right. uh, to answer your question right. about breeding them multiple times. But, but that is but how the, they, they continue producing. That's right. It, and that's it, also how you build it, your herd. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we use the, if, if we have a female calf, when the cow calves, if, if the calf is a female, we keep that, we raise it, and she's, a, she's our future uh, generations in our herd. So. Right. Future milk giver. Yep. Now, yeah. um, are you guys registered? Do you, no, do you we're not. Holsteins? We did not have registered Holsteins. Okay. No, no. So how many Holsteins do you milk a day? We're milking about 60 right here, okay. to, right now, and twice a day. And then how about the jerseys at the we other farm? We have 40, we're milking 40 jerseys twice a day. Do you remember the farm before the creamery started? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so tell me what the difference is now, now and then. Now, you're supplying milk for your own products. How is that different than back in the day before, before you started the creamery? 
Well, there's a, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a couple differences, I think. One of the things you have to realize, that's been almost 18 years ago, which my gr grandfather would have still been farming. So it's my grandfather and my dad and my brother and me. Um, I had just gotten married at 19 and there's just not enough revenue. And the way the milk market is, we wanted somewhat of some control over our product. Plus we knew that we were committed to producing a premium product on the farm. So we wanted to go ahead with that on the uh, sales side. Now back in, back in 2000, 1999 to 2001, there was a lot of talk in the dairy industry about people doing this. Mm -hmm. um, it was a new concept and if you think years ago, a lot of people had family farms and family creamers and then they went away and then they started coming back. So when we started, the workload and the stress level was increased sure. and it's kind of a shell shock. A normal a normal farmer really doesn't know how to market his milk. He really doesn't know a lot of the, he's a very sharp businessman a lot of times, but the public appearance and the marketing um, part of the sale is something he's never had to do. Are you glad, are you still glad you're doing this? Um, most days, most <laughs> days. I'm trying to be honest here. I, well, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> um, th there's a lot, so Darian is a, uh, it's not a job, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle choice. And so you have, to, um, you have to know that going into it. And so yeah, there's days, and I think it's that way in any, any job or any industry, you're gonna have days where maybe you don't like your job as much. But for the most part, it's a good way of life. I mean, it's a good way to raise a family. Um, and I can tell you that at the, at the end of the day, you feel like you've done an honest day's work. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> If you don't go to bed sore, you That's mean, right. you, you, you've forgotten to do something you, that day. You didn't, right? earn, you didn't earn your keep that day. So. <laughs> yep. Jamie, thanks so much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. So, Donnie, here we are at the creamery, and we're really interested in how you guys make butter and you make ice cream. So, first of all, the truck has gotten here from the farm. Now what happens? So, the truck arrives with the... Um, raw milk. The raw milk is pumped from the truck to the silos out front and then it's brought into this piece of equipment which is a cream separator and we, we roll a portable tank in here to put the cream in so the, the milk actually goes through here. It separates the cream out and puts it in the portable tank. Uh, the skim milk goes back into the big tank, the large tank beside of me. And then the cream is what we use for butter and ice cream. So the cream has now been separated, and that's what you use for the butter and the ice cream. That's correct. So first, let's start our education process with butter. What happens to the cream that's been separated to make the butter? Okay, first the cream that's been separated, remember it was in a raw product, so it has to be pasteurized before we can do anything with it. So. It goes through the pasteurizer, it's heated up to kill the harmful bacteria, and then after that, it goes into a churn, a butter churn. We have a, a pretty small churn right now, um, and we make all our butter by hand. And so we put 40 pounds of cream into the churn. It takes about 20 minutes to churn the butter, and it yields about 40% or between 40 and 45%. So we would get 17 pounds of butter out of 40 pounds of cream. Wow. That seems like a really big ratio, difference in ratio from milk to butter. But I guess when you think about it, so if it only takes 20 minutes, that churn must be moving at a pretty good speed. Uh, it does, but you know, you can take it, and you can put it in a cup and shake it and make butter. If you take cream, uh, the important thing is it can't be really real cold. It, it works better if it's 40 degrees or more right. so that you can, it churns a little quicker. Churns a little better? Yep. So do you guys add butter, I mean add butter, add salt or anything else to your butter? We do. We make salted and unsalted. Okay. So we lightly salt it and that's the only thing that's added to it. It's pure cream butter okay. with a little bit of salt and then we also do an unsalted for people that like to use it to cook with or chefs. Okay. Now. Once it's in that churn 
and it's now butter. It's thickened in its butter state. How do you package it? So the butter is worked by hand. You know, the, the secret to the shelf life of butter is to get the whey out, which is the liquid that's in the butter itself. And so we still do that by hand. Uh, so it, ha it takes a little work by hand to get the whey out. And then they actually stamp out the half pounds and pounds of butter by hand. Okay. And then they're, we put them in a little freezer and let them get firm. And then we bring them out and wrap them in a clear cellophane package. Okay. Now, where does your butter get sold? I know it's here in your refrigerator case, but does it go, is it sold everywhere your milk is sold? Um, almost everywhere. Most of the grocery stores carry it. And now you mentioned chefs. Do you have um, chefs requesting your butter in the area or even on the East Coast? Uh, we have had some requests. You know, butter's kind of tough because we don't have but so much cream. <laughs> and so we have to be careful that we don't oversell butter and ice cream and not have the cream to supply it. Right. So the milk's brought in and separated into skim and the cream in this container. Now, tell me what happens to this cream when you make ice cream. Okay, we take the cream uh, and, and mix milk with it to, to make our ice, base ice cream mix, which would include everything but the flavoring. Um, and it goes into this tank, and then we add sugar, uh, stabilizer or whatever else needs to go into the mix. After that is mixed, it is run through the pasteurizer, and then it goes into a holding tank in the ice cream hall. Uh, and then we do it, we freeze it in batch freezers from there. We only, we only make ice cream one flavor at a time, but the, all of the base mix is mixed in here all the same. Okay. And so when we put it in the ice cream freezer, it's just like making it in a white mountain at home. It's a batch. And so we put the mix in, and then we add the flavoring, whatever kind we want to make that day. 36 flavors regularly, and then uh, four holiday flavors. We can make like two, up to 2,000 quarts or so per day. Uh, we can do 200 tubs per day. Uh, or we can do 4,000 four and eight ounce cups in a day. And so it depends on what our orders are as to what we will produce that day and how many different flavors we do. So we've seen the process of making the ice cream and the butter. It's quite a process and it's really interesting. But I want to talk a little bit about your milk. Now you guys bottle your milk in glass bottles. Why is that? Well that was a big, um, we had a long conversation about that in the beginning. Uh, we decided we were a niche product and so in order to be a niche it was better to be different than so that we had made some differentiation on the shelf with other milks and so that would be one of the reasons. Um, the other reason is, uh, I don't know, the presentation for a high quality product looks well in glass and that's what we wanted to do. Um, also glass is a lot better insulator. Um, it keeps the milk colder longer when it's out. Um, and it's also tastes better because it doesn't have anything to pull any uh, off flavors from right. being in a glass. Right. And it's also recyclable. It feels nice to me to hold this in, in this glass in my hand. It just, it feels nice and it is extremely cold. I'd say a lot colder than plastic, for sure. So, the other thing with your milk, you offer a lot of flavors. I mean, in this case behind us, we have chocolate, orange, strawberries, and your mocha, which is called what? Cal Pacino. Cal Pacino. I love that. So 
Let's talk about Homestead Creamery, the business. When did you start Homestead and why on earth would you start a creamery? You know, I've been asked that question before. <laughs> why on earth would you start a creamery? Aren't you busy enough, <laughs> enough as a dairy farmer? As a dairy farmer, we were busy enough. Um, you know, it was something that I probably had thought about prior to 2001 when we started. That was the year we actually started in January of 2001. Okay. Uh, we put in equipment on January 1. Um, we had product on the shelf on January 17th of that year. Uh, we had a little store in the plant, and that's where we promoted our products to start with. But I guess, I, you know, in the back of my mind, I thought it always thought it'd be neat to um, process your own product and put it on shelf somewhere. But probably wouldn't have ever started had it not been for the younger generation. I had two sons that were interested in the farm. Um, Dave Bauer, my partner, was buying his father's farm. and So we started talking and at that time milk prices were sort of like they are now. They were pretty bad on the farm level and so really we were looking for a sustainable model to carry the family farms forward so we were trying to add value to what we already had. Well you know for years we've been talking about value-added products and for our farmers to succeed these days you almost have to branch out and do value-added and boy you really did it in a big way. <laughs> well you know if, if you read the definition of an entrepreneur, it doesn't really say that they're crazy, but it, <laughs> it says that they take some pretty big risk. And so I guess that's, you know, most farmers are that way. They're entrepreneurs and um, they don't mind taking a risk. Um, it, was, it was a pretty big risk. It was sort of an out of the box thing at the time. And, you know, we went, put our milk in glass bottles, which was not much of that done at the time, everybody had gone to cartons and um, jugs. Where, what are your plans for the creamery? Are you going to expand? Are you going to bring in more dairies? Well, actually, we've already done that. Um, you know, we started out with two dairies, and it took a few years to use all that milk, and now we use the milk from four farms. Um, yes, of course, since we built over and expanded our plant, we will have to increase. Um, at the same time, we'd like, we would like to not get too far away from what we really are. Right. So we have to continue to think about that as we expand. Um, we just want to be a strong local company that supports the community and provides a quality product for the consumer. Well. Every time I've been here, it's always crowded. There's people in buying milk, buying ice cream for sure. Um, are you happy being such a, a big part of this community right now? We are, we are a big part of the community since there's a, you know, we have travelers here, tourists here in the summertime that go to the lake and so, it is a nice stop for them, for the people that pass through. A lot of those people have families that live here, and so they travel back and forth, and we're just um, grateful to be a part of the community, of this little community here, because it, um, Burnt Henry was a pretty small place in 2001. <laughs> Still is. I've been really surprised at times of, of the knowledge that people had of animals. Um, really surprised but if you think about it um, you know there's I don't know how many generations now that are totally removed from the farm they were, were raised in the city um, and they never had an opportunity to be at the farm to see these animals so they really don't know they don't understand um, and so it, it's to us it's nice to be able to educate them on how you know, milk is really made and what it really takes to um, provide milk for the consumer. What's that over there? Look over there. 
Oh, she got some uh, ice cream. <laughs> I stole it! <laughs> Pardon my spoon. <laughs> I didn't even ask. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security.